Welcome, everyone. This is uh, Tomorrow's Problem Podcast. My name is Nolan. And I'm Jake. And this is episode three, part two. Nice. The formative years. So we are going into the next stage, the, the new era of school shootings. And uh, again, we're going to be picking unique examples of how school shootings started to shift within the U.S. and throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just unique to the U.S., but we'll see a lot of these big ones. That's right. And this point borders. in time from uh, mid 20th century till the late 90s, we start to see uh, school shootings that really uh, kind of develop what we expect from school shootings nowadays. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the, these themes and trends yep. really all happen kind of in the 80s and oh, yeah. uh, 90s. In the 90s. Yeah, and that sets the stage not only for the perpetrator, but also community response. Exactly. We're going to talk about how uh, police respond, responded to different incidents, mm -hmm. uh, how that changed, uh, especially with Columbine, yeah. spoiler alert. <laughs> um, but that, that really changed. Uh, also psychology, like how they were researching it, what they were looking for, different warning signs. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have Peter Langman yeah. um, talk about that, but that's when he started you know, his research was back in 2000, that's right. yeah. 2001, right too, yeah, right after Columbine. And we're also going to start to see a shift in the motivations for these perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, before it was a lot of personal grievances and one-off events, now we're seeing kind of the acute stressors of the modern world working their way into the motivations. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about like failed ambition, antisocial behavior, mm -hmm. this kind of new age aggression. Oh, yeah. That's when we're going to start seeing it. Definitely. So... Yeah, that's a perfect transition into Gong Lu that's right. and University of Iowa. So uh, the first incident uh, that we want to look at is in 1981. There was a graduate student named Gong Lu. He was a uh, Chinese student mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, studying physics and uh, all that wonderful um, space, space, space junk, basically. plasma, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah he, he was in an interesting department. And uh, his... His issue, or kind of what we've pieced what spurred together, him on. yeah, what spurred him on, was he was um, kind of in the running for different different awards and uh, kind of prizes to help continue his education. Right, a lot of uh, academics need grant money, prize money to be able to continue their research. That's right. And uh, so he completed his graduate uh, studies, his masters, and uh, there was a dissertation prize that was awarded to another student, which actually was his roommate. Uh, $2,500, and he didn't win that that dissertation prize, and he was mad. He was mad yeah. at the faculty, mad at everyone around him, mad at his roommates, and uh, a lot of anger. That's right. And, you know, Gonglu was very much a part of this really interesting uh, kind of genre of, of school shooters where it's uh, like the collegiate mm -hmm. academics. You yeah. know, we have Amy Bishop, mm -hmm. Valerie Fabricant, uh, Jose Reyes, mm -hmm. all of them that... Uh, all psychopathic yep. killers that because of the stresses innate in the college system with, yeah. you know, getting tenure yep. and the competitive nature of being a professor really starts to, can really like make people that are susceptible to this crack. Yeah. That's a really good object. Yeah. I really like that because you see it's almost because, and it's especially because they're in that kind of higher level of academics, they're usually very intelligent. They're oh, very yeah, yeah. Uh, eloquent um, and so you almost just see this psychosis more easily, yeah. this, this um, psychopathy. And there's definitely some ego tied into that, mm -hmm. too. Definitely. So Gong Lu, right, he doesn't have enough money to continue his education, his postdoctoral research. Mm -hmm. um, he's not going to be able to stay in the U.S. At the same time that this is happening, you know, there's the Tiananmen Square massacre in China. Uh, yeah. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah. <laughs> so we have a, a lot of stuff that's happening back in his, his uh, homeland that he didn't want to return to. Of course, yeah. And so he was trying everything to stay. And so there was just kind of this boiling point where he exploded and he brought, you know, a pistol, brought his firearm to to the... To, uh, to campus. To campus. Brought it to um, a meeting. They were having like a committee meeting. Began shooting at different uh, professors, um, uh, teachers... Students, he shot the 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 prize winner, the mm -hmm. student who won the the prize, yes. his roommate, um, killed him. Killed another, uh, one of the leading scientists in like space pl plasma physics. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Like top top, like very niche, right? Yeah. 
Um, kind of like a burgeoning field of study, too, mm-hmm. at the time. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Gong Lu was a loner. So when this happened, there wasn't, like, a lot of shock, per se. He had been showing a lot of warning signs. Yeah. Very aggressive, very in- angry, um, and abusive. He would yeah. throw these abusive tantrums if he was ever challenged. in Like his, his opinions in yeah, class? Opinions, um, thoughts, whatever it was. And he would just go into these abusive tantrums towards students, um, his constituents, all that. Wow. So, yeah, what we kind of see with Gong Lu is this failed ambition. Mm-hmm. We're going to see that a lot. And it, it, it doesn't always take, you know, the the color of academics, right? That can be failed masculinity. That can sure. be blocked ambition with religious pursuits or spiritual pursuits or uh, financial pursuits, right? There's a lot of block blockage that yeah. can be experienced. Uh, and then also anger management. Like his mm. his sadism, his, um, his, his cruelty towards other people was, I mean, very um, kind of points towards psychopathic totally yeah well yeah that that actually is a great segue into the next event because uh one of these fellows andrew golden um was one of the, it's kind of the one of the prime examples of a psychopathic shooter mm-hmm. and so this is uh back in 1998 we're talking mitchell johnson and andrew golden mm-hmm. and this is in west side middle school and uh the interesting thing to, to give you a little context about this is that very rarely do we have do shooters come in pairs, right? That is a pretty rare occurrence. Mm-hmm. And you know when you think you know we later we'll talk about Columbine. That's another uh, pair. There's usually one kind of leading the charge yeah. and one kind of following. Yep. And the interesting thing about this is Andrew Golden was only 11, and he was the one that exhibited the most psychopathic traits. Yeah. And he was kind of leading the charge, whereas yeah. Mitchell Johnson was two years older than him. He was 13. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine that an eleven-year-old having the wherewithal to perpetrate a a school attack? Mm-hmm. Was wherewithal? No one's smiling at wherewithal. No, I'm smiling because I was Jacob and I are like two years apart, and I was like, I could see Jacob definitely leading the charge. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to cut that. <laughs> no, we're keeping that. We're keeping that. <laughs> but uh, maybe yeah. in like a a dodgeball match or a mm-hmm. pie contest, I'll lead the charge in definitely. one of those situations. <laughs> But yeah, it really shows that it doesn't matter how old or young you are. Uh, and we, we we might include a link to, like, Jacob actually showed me this. It's an interview with a psychopathic girl. And oh, she's like yeah. Eight, nine child years old. of Rage yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, Child of Rage. Really cool. Really fascinating to listen to how she talks. That's right. How she considers and weighs the uh, kind of the value of her family members yeah. and people around her and animals and all that yeah. stuff. For, for some context, this little girl was came from a very acutely abusive relationship as an infant, mm. was adopted into a family, and, you know, started exhibiting these really bizarre mm. psychopathic behaviors, like sticking pins in her baby brother. Yeah, and her dogs. And yeah, and, like and just talking about wanting to kill her family and stuff. Mm. And, yeah, it's very interesting uh, video yeah. we'll we'll post a link with this and it's really difficult to kind of see those signs in children mm-hmm. when as they're growing because children are a little psychopathic yeah. they don't they're very selfish right self-preservation they have those instincts to kind of protect yeah. themselves so they're little animals yeah, yeah exactly they so learned the rules yet when they you know andrew golden and, and mitchell johnson and, and the reason one of the reasons you could really see the the difference between the two is during their sentencing mitchell johnson was crying he was sobbing like sh- like super upset, mm-hmm. knew what he had done, apologized, had public apologies to, made public apologies to his victims, the victim's family, to his community. Andrew Johnson, or Andrew Golden, sorry. Andrew Golden never apologized. No, Even when he was convicted, he, they know he's guilty, wow. he's in prison, never apologized till the day he died. Hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, so, no, what happened? All right, so, uh, Andrew and Mitchell, they stockpiled. Yeah. So one difference between them is they didn't they weren't going to go out in a blaze of glory. They didn't want to commit suicide. So True. they they preemptively stocked a van. They loaded up a van with uh foods, provisions, uh a ammunition. bunch of guns. Yeah, a bunch of guns. Um it was, it was Andrew Golden's grandfather, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. And uh loaded up this van, drove it over, and uh Andrew went out, snuck into the school around noon. Uh, people are having lunch and out of classes, and he pulls the fire alarm. That's right. So everyone empties out of the school. And uh, they had 
picked out a spot that was up on this like hill next to a tree line per with a perfect sight into the courtyard mm -hmm. where everyone was evacuating everyone's too. emptying out yeah. exactly and so everyone starts emptying out of the school um you know doing their roll call that's normal emergency protocol right yeah and they began shooting at them mm -hmm. and uh they initially everyone thought it was a joke it was you know firecracker something's going on they didn't realize people were getting hit yeah they thought it was construction happening mm -hmm. the next lot over yeah so they didn't really like start leaving until like they started seeing people bleeding and getting yeah. shot so they 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 started so they started escaping and uh, trying to get back into the school fleeing and uh andrew and mitchell try and run to their van but at that point police had shown up yeah you know, a pretty quick response they you know, intervened and they were able to kind of uh, intersect and, you know, hit them before uh, they got to the van. And an interesting thing, too, is that when, for some reason, when they evacuated, the doors to their school locked. Yeah. So they were trapped outside mm -hmm. during the shooting. Yeah, like fire protocol yeah. or some kind of fire system that yeah. locked the doors. And I don't know if we've talked about this, but there is a... In the, in the realm of school security, there is a weird problem mm -hmm. with the lack of codes regarding the campus security. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there it really is just like a trial by fire for in this uh, decade and the next mm -hmm. of them just figuring out as they go along, like, mm -hmm. what, what in building a school can lead to susceptibility during an active shooter. Yeah. What are the vulnerable yeah. parts of the school? And how many and codes are there for that in regards to a school security? I mean, in terms of like fire code or... not? No, in oh. terms of a school security. Security, yeah. Zero. Yeah. It's not like fire code. Yeah, where there's over 300. Mm -hmm. So that's something that kind of one of the hurdles that we have to jump over. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, you know, they get tried as minors, so they only yeah. serve until they're... 21 years old, they're convicted. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting thing, too, is they they had been shooting... A lot of... 14 out of the 15 victims were girls. So they at oh. first they thought it was like a sexist thing, like they were targeting girls. But also it was just a group of people. They just happened to have really? been hitting yeah. classes with more girls that were... Yeah, you know, the girls to grouped up together to talk mm -hmm. and stuff. Yep. Yeah, of course. And I, I think a couple teachers, too, were killed. Yeah. Or one. Yeah, a couple. I, I can't remember now. What the... Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they, they were put on trial, convicted as minors, mm -hmm. they served, their... served a, a short sentence, yeah. relatively short. They got out in their early 20s. Mm -hmm. 21, yeah. 21. Uh, I think Mitchell Johnson went on to live kind of a quiet life. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I think he got uh, popped one time for trying to buy a gun. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah. I don't know if you know anything about gun law, but when you do a school shooting, you're never going gonna... you're, you're to get a gun again. <laughs> Sorry, Mitchell. And that's, I mean, he probably should have known that. Probably should have known that. And then Andrew Golden actually passed away when he was like 33 mm -hmm. and head on collision. You know, they're, they're from Arkansas out there and someone was going 100 miles an hour in the opposite lane and actually killed him. It was him. an elderly. Elderly guy. Yeah. And he actually, he had a, a wife and, a, and kids. Yeah. Um, but he was the only one that died and, and the other driver. Yeah. But... So goodbye, Andrew Golden. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. well. So the important things about this one is is very much the idea that there was two shooters mm -hmm. and kind of different mental headspaces. Yeah, I think definitely too. Just the age. Mm -hmm. You know, this this is the youngest uh, perpetrators we've seen yet. Oh yeah, yeah. There's only one other that's younger, and it was a kid who brought his gun to school. Have you ever heard of that one? They were like six, seven years old, like yeah. first graders, and he brought it, and he didn't, he didn't really know what it was, but he, he shot his classmate. Yeah. But just because she was, like, he was mad at her. Okay, so this is the, the young, as yeah. of now, the youngest intentional mm -hmm. school shooting perpetrators. Exactly okay. right. Okay, interesting. Well, great, let's move on to 1998. Same year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them that are kind of back to yeah. back. Going a little west to Oregon, Thurston High School. Now this, you know, like we said before, Mitchell Johnson, Andrew Golden, or Andrew Golden specifically, you know, kind of the poster child for psychopathy. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're doing a poster child for uh, psychosis, psychotic shooters, Kip Kinkle. Yeah. Definitely. Kip Kinkle's the guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kip Kinkle had a relatively normal life. Mm -hmm. Parents were 
um, decent folk, you know, yeah. had a had a nice upbringing, and uh, he just had a hard time uh, wrestling those voices in his head. Yeah, he was he was bullied a bit at school, mm -hmm. but you know that's normal. Yeah, but yeah, his biggest thing is he was struggling a lot with mental health issues. That's right. Um, breakdown, psychotic episodes. Had a little bit of trouble at school as well. Mm -hmm. He was expelled for purchasing the stolen firearm of one of his friends. That's right. Uh, the friend went to his house, or you know, to his own house, stole, stole his dad's gun, yep, stole his dad's Beretta, uh, brought it to school, and was gonna sell it to Kip. And Kip bought it for about a hundred and ten dollars. Steal. Nice, yeah. Double entendre. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, when he was questioned, he admitted to it. He yeah. was like, you know what, guys, I'm gonna be up front with you. I stole the gun. It's in my locker. They went and searched yeah. his locker. Found Not it. a devious kid. Nah. Not some guy who's trying to pull one over on the school. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, so he, his dad comes, picks him up. He, he was arrested and uh, he was pretty frazzled from all of that. Very frustrated. You know, he's got a felony, couple felony charges now and he hasn't even graduated high school. Mm -hmm. So he's in, he's in deep waters. And uh, this was probably one of the motivators or kind of maybe the first domino to start the school shooting because I wonder what he was trying to buy that gun for. Yeah. You know? If not for the the future school shooting, yeah, and it was a nine millimeter, uh, which is you know stopping power, higher stopping power. That the pistol that he eventually used was only a twenty two, mm. a Ruger twenty two, which is not as effective. And, yeah, and so when he gets home, you know spends the spends probably a sleepless night. Yeah, he's, to, he's told he's going to get sent to military school. Yep, yeah, his father told him if he's not going to quit misbehaving, he's going to be sent to military mm -hmm. school. Another aggravating factor. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, wakes up, he uh, takes his father's pistol and uh, goes downstairs and, and murders his father. Murders mm -hmm. his father who was at the breakfast table, you know, eating breakfast at the table. And uh, waits for his mother to come home. So first he drags his father and covers him with a sheet. Waits for his mother to come home, murders her as well. Covers her as well. And if anyone listened to the last uh, part of this episode, mm -hmm. you'll remember that Charles Whitman, too, killed his mother, killed his wife, covered them in a white sheet. Yeah. Next episode, we'll have another that does the same thing when they kill their mom. Yep. And then even a similar phrase that uh, Kip used, similar to Charles, uh, in his murder-suicide note that he left at home that the police found later, he says, I just got two felonies on my record. My parents can't take that. It would destroy them. The embarrassment would be too much for them. They couldn't live with themselves. He was he was more worried about, you know, kind of the embarrassment that they were having from these felony charges yeah. instead of, you know, he's almost like taking them out of this world to uh, yeah. help them with that. It just shows like the lack of logic almost that goes mm -hmm. into a lot of the decision to commit a school attack. Because you see yeah. them using logic to uh, realize that like there's going to be aftermath mm -hmm. there's going their family is going to be affected by this but there's still this force compelling them to do a school shooting yeah and they can't understand it exactly. it's just a force yep psychotic unraveling and mm -hmm. that that's a perfect i mean the the rest of the note he says my head just doesn't work right god damn these voices inside my head i have to kill people i don't know why i have no other choice no other choice yeah like you said a compelling force and later on, when he was, you know, being treated for his psychosis, his his mental health problems, you know, all that, he, they were able to identify different voices that he was saying were telling him different things, and mm -hmm. he was extremely remorseful after his treatment. After yeah, at least it seems genuine. It's been going on for yeah, and, and, until now. And when you hear about the voices he describes, it's not like a cartoon like, oh, I have a bad voice and mm -hmm. a, a posh voice mm -hmm. and a hillbilly voice. You know, it's like, you know, like someone who like Nicholas Cruz is, is trying to convince people, you yeah. know, his voices are very nuanced. Uh -huh. You know, one telling him to do something, yeah. one telling, convincing him of the other voice. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's very oh, interesting, yeah. real, real thing. Yeah. Like, we all have voices in our head that kind of talk to us, but they never overshadow our own mm -hmm. voice. My voice keeps telling me to eat and never stop eating. <laughs> and growing vegetables. And growing vegetables. <laughs> yeah, so Kip, when he went to the school, he, he shot, he only actually, he only, he only murdered two students. and He injured over 25 
uh, because it was such a small caliber weapon. But uh, when he was being subdued by students, actually one of the students that subdued him was an injured student and got back up, yeah. tackled him, and a bunch of them tackled him. He was telling him, kill me, kill me, please, just I want to die, I want to die. He was trying to kill himself. Um, and then he actually had a knife hidden in his shoe. He gets to the police station after he's arrested, and he takes out the knife and tries to stab one of the police officers again. Suicide you know, by cop, maybe? Suicide by cop, exactly. He was trying to die, and... and uh, yeah, very interesting yeah. After, aftermath. If, if there's any of these perpetrators that we should have any level of sympathy for, it's probably mm -hmm. Kip Kinkle. Yeah. Yeah, extremely remorseful. Really after. tortured. Yeah. Um, Not saying what he did was right or justified at all, mm -hmm. but, you know, just, you know, you feel bad for someone who had to live that kind of life. Yeah. Not understanding what's, yeah. what's going on. It would yeah. be interesting to, to talk with them and even understand where he stands even now because yeah. he's, he's up and he's in prison to yeah. the, you know to this day so serving in a, an ele a 111 year prison sentence mm. you don't Give come out take of that one year. no all right let's move on to the next year all right columbine on 420 mm -hmm. that's actually interesting too uh, a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions about Col in fact i would say columbine is the most misconceived uh school shooting out there there are so many elements to this that the public just thinks Confusion. is, is uh, you know, gospel mm -hmm. is not the case. Yeah. One of them being, they didn't sh plan this to be on 420, yeah. on a marijuana holiday. Or Hitler's birthday. Or Hitler's birthday. Yeah. The reason that they uh, did this on the 20th was they actually were planning to do it on the 19th. Yeah. But some of their ammo didn't get shipped to their house in time. Mm-hmm. So they just had to push it back a day. So they had to push it back a day. NBK, that was the name of their plan mm -hmm. nbk stands for natural born killers yeah which is a uh, oliver stone movie that greatly influenced them i'm mm -hmm. sure you guys have heard of it they watched it hundreds of times they, they loved that movie have you seen that movie you told me not to watch it remember? it's not very good you i said don't know it was bad. it's just it's, woody harrelson yeah it's woody harrelson it's just so over the top who's the female uh actress in that oh she's in juliet lewis oh yeah juliet lewis Interesting. The movie was by, or it was directed by Oliver Stone, story by Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. yeah. And you can tell there's a lot of like elements that are yeah. like Quentin Tarantino, the stylized violence, mm -hmm. you know, interesting. And they wanted, they, when they talked about their legacy, they wanted Quentin Tarantino. They oh, personally named right. him as the, they wanted him to direct their movie. Wow. Which I, yeah. Can, can you think of the level of ego it takes to plan a school shooting and then thinking about the movie that gets made mm -hmm. about it? Well, I mean, Eric Harris thought he was God. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, yeah. his ego was up there. If anyone watches It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Dennis Reynolds is Eric Harris. Yeah. Very, they are the, he is he the, is the golden the, god. The golden god. On oh, high. yeah. I am God. I am, I am perfect. Mm -hmm. Everyone is beneath me i'm yeah. superior to everything and we're going to talk about eric harris in future episodes because mm -hmm. he is a great example of a true psychopathic totally. uh shooter because and i mean one of the benefits to is, is we have all his journals his videos yeah. he has so much content that we were able to see what he was thinking and that's really what defines columbine and it's kind of the interesting fact that we can pull away from it is the media package mm -hmm. that Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris had almost prepared mm -hmm. upon the the uh, aftermath of their attack. Yep. They had videos of them shooting guns. Mm -hmm. They had journal entries, recordings, the basement tapes. The basement tapes, yeah. They, they, they're really, this was the first one that was like a goldmine of personal content yeah. from the perpetrator. That, yep. of course, the media loved yeah of course and and other people there's a huge fandom of eric and dylan right yeah we, we've seen forums and Ugh. and conversations yeah it's disgusting it's gross it's really gross um it's it's upsetting yeah because and i mean we talked about this earlier but you know we there's victims in these uh these yeah. events there's people whose lives have forever changed yeah and and besides having those people live again the best thing we can hope for is that what the perpetrators wanted doesn't get accomplished, mm -hmm. right? And what Eric Harris wanted was to have a fan club. Yeah. And yeah, that's like what happened. So it's pretty disappointing. Yeah. You people out there that are into Columbine, 
get into something else. Yeah, seriously. Like uh, community service. Juggling, man. Yeah, anything. Yo-yos. So, and another big ass, another important. Uh, a big con- ass. Yeah. Big- <laughs> another big ass aspect. <laughs> Uh, another important thing to consider with the Columbine shooting was police response. Yes. And that's what we wanted to kind of touch on with, with this introduction is, yeah. is how police tactics changed. And, and we'll probably talk about this with Jimmy yeah. in another episode. But essentially, I'll give you a quick uh, timeline. So the shooting starts at 11.19. Mm-hmm. Eric and Dylan had already set up their bombs, but then those bombs didn't go off. So they went, they started mm-hmm. walking on campus to go and, and find some targets. And so... They actually run into Deputy Deputy Neil Gardner, uh, who started exchanging fire with them at eleven twenty four, mm-hmm. and uh, after that they kind of go in and he starts you know firing at them, but he doesn't engage with them more than that. And police who arrive later, you know, between eleven twenty four and twelve oh eight, which which is when Eric and Dylan supposedly killed themselves, um, you know, just because that's a time frame we don't know if it was twelve oh eight exactly, but that was the last shot that was heard. Totally. Uh, so police formed a perimeter. Mm -hmm. They formed a perimeter for half an hour. You know, students are running out of the school trying to escape. Um, they're getting kind of patchy information of what's happening inside. And, uh, so SWAT doesn't enter the school until 109, which is, you know, two hours later. Wow. And SWAT is slowly going through the school, clearing room by room by room, because that, that was how tactics, that's how it was done back in the day. Um, it was almost like World War II era tactics where, you know, you clear a house, you go through each room slowly, check your corners. And uh, at that, you know, because of that, to stay safe, uh, you know, there's kids jumping out windows. You know, there's yeah. that famous picture boy in the window. That's right. Bleeding kids jumping out of windows trying to get to safety. And just for reference, the uh, Sandy Hook shooting, Adam Lanza killed almost 30 people mm-hmm. in less than three minutes or around three minutes. Mm-hmm. So you compare that to two hours and the terror that could that took place in that school, mm-hmm. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and so after they answered, it took them another few hours to clear the whole school and declare it safe yeah. until four thirty. Yeah. So that's another three hours, three four hours. So very long response, very yeah. long, grueling process, and after that they completely yeah. changed. It's yeah. now now it is first man in. First man in until Uvalde. Yeah. Uh, Uvalde kind of threw a wrench in that whole procedure beca- or protocol because... They did a very Columbine-esque mm-hmm. response. Yeah, they formed a perimeter. They took their time. They waited for a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, one thing that Jim, Jimmy really uh, shared, I, I will never forget this, but he, he said, you know, police... After Columbine, there was a quote, right? Uh, there should be more dead cops here, not dead kids. Yeah. And really, that's kind of the, uh, that's up to the police to, to rush in, even if they're outmanned, outgunned, yeah. they go in there and they fight like hell. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, Dylan and Eric, they had guns, they were unhinged, mm-hmm. but they did not have the resources that police have. They didn't have the, the team and mm-hmm. the, the strategy. No. No. So that that's kind of part of their legacy is, is the change in police tactics. Yeah. Community response. Um, how people came together afterwards to, to support the families, support the community. That was a big thing, right? Yeah. That's, that's where a lot of psychological research started to, to happen. That's right, yeah. And because of Columbine, there was a there, there was a few. There was a ripple effect after Columbine when there were some copycat school shooters that mm-hmm. happened. One of them, can't remember exactly his name, uh, in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, ends up in a, a, a psychiatric hospital. And that's where Peter Langman began, began his study on school shooters, exactly. was with that school shooter. Yeah. In the aftermath of Columbine. Yeah. So there's just, a, like you said, a ripple and this, this legacy just kind of, and even the way school shooters started to adopt, yes. you know. Sung Hee Cho. Yeah, Sung Hee Cho, uh, even Elliot Rodger. I mean, a lot yeah. of them praised Eric and Dylan in their manifestos, yeah. in their dying words. Like yeah. it's. And we'll talk about Sung Hee Cho next uh, part of the episode, but you look at the media package that he delivered, mm-hmm. it's it's like a copy mm-hmm. of Dylan and Eric. Exactly. The the black clothes, the guns akimbo. Yep. Oh, yeah. 
very stylized. Like they, yeah. they want to create an image for yes. people to perceive them. And to deflate that image is, is, is uh, oof. they want to create an image that's not really there. Yeah. Uh, one of the last journal entries in Eric Harris's journal was he was still trying to kiss a girl, get laid. He was trying to have sex before he died. Yeah. And he was so frustrated that he, he went out with a whimper. He yeah. was like, I, I don't know why no one wants to be my friend and all this. And, and all these other in- entries were just like talking about how he wanted to rape people and kill yes. indiscriminately, his racism, his misogyny, all this stuff. And then he went out really showing his true colors. Yeah. I think when he was finally at that realization, that's who he was. He was yes. just a scared, insecure, sunken chested boy yeah. who wanted to be a Nazi because that would make him feel stronger. Yeah. But it didn't. It's just, it, yeah, it's, it's literally just like the edge lord from 2011, you know, it, it literally was like the proto version of that, oh, yeah. whose entire image was based on fringes uh-huh. and wanting people to think that they're dangerous when yeah. really they were just insecure. Mm-hmm. Dylan too, Dylan especially. That, and that happens, you see that with incels now, a lot yeah. of incel shooters. There's a pattern, there's mm-hmm. definitely a pattern. Yeah, and like we said, these guys really kind of influenced the the style, the aesthetic mm-hmm. of school shooters in the future. Yeah. Um, and we hate them. Yeah. <laughs> we don't like these guys. Yeah. They uh, they have left a terrible stain mm-hmm. on human history. Yeah. And uh, but that kind of wraps up the you know the the turn of the century. Brings us right up to the two thousands. Mm-hmm. And where things really start getting worse. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't get better. Um, tactics change. And you'd think we'd become more prepared. Yeah. Right? Again, that's one of the reasons we started the podcast. Like, what's, 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 what isn't happening? Yeah. Cut those out. <laughs> <laughs> when I get really excited about things, I start to stutter. I just, yeah. there's, I want to say it so he quickly. He is quaking in his Nike shoes right now. <laughs> In his size 17s. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so guys, we will be, uh, folks, we will be jumping into the next, the final. Yeah, final uh, chapter, starting with Virginia day. Tech, going till Uvalde. Yep, present day, and we might even talk a little bit about Highland Park. Oh, yeah. As well, Good so point. not a school shooting, but just talking about patterns. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we hope to have you in the next episode, and uh Share this with people uh, you know and love. Truly. So uh, stay safe out there, and we'll see you in the next one. And we love you. <laughs>